Nine years ago, I just got fired for the fourth time from radio. I was back home living with my mom in South Carolina. I just had like the worst panic attack of my life and it really felt like I was having a heart attack and dying. In 2015, I went through a serious depression. I had kind of lost hope on life. I didn't want to get out of bed. I didn't really want to talk to friends. I found myself as a high functioning person dealing with depression. I grew up in African-American culture and you know, mental health was and still is in a lot of areas in our community taboo. So we didn't talk about it. I've always had uh, panic attacks, anxiety attacks. Like my whole life, I just didn't know what they were. And I actually got really diagnosed was nine years ago. And um, I went to the hospital because I always felt like I was having problems with my heart, like all the time. Like that, but that, those were the panic attacks. Now, eight years later, none of that, none of this has changed. My father took his own life when I was seven months old from a gunshot wound to the head. And I have two siblings, so it was really difficult for my siblings and my mom and I growing up. We never went to counseling as a family, so I suppressed a lot of those feelings and just kind of buried myself in my work and became this uber successful student and went on to work in the entertainment industry, having a wonderful career. But, you know, as life happens, you know, success and money doesn't mean everything. So I started getting stressed out at work, started experiencing, you know, depression and anxiety, but I didn't really know what to call it. Everything's supposed to be all good, like, you know, finances, success, your people good, like you think everything's all great, but it's not. You still have those panic attacks and you still have that anxiety, so that's what made me finally say, you know what, let me go go get a handle on this. I have an older sister, and because of my dad's suicide, she ended up putting herself through therapy when she was in college. For many, many, many years, she told me that she thought I needed therapy, and I didn't think I needed it. You know, it was my own ego. In 2014, my um, best friend took her own life, so that kind of hit rock bottom after her death. I blamed myself a lot, so the guilt, the shame, um, really took a toll on me. In 2015, I contemplated taking my own life and, you know, gratefully I was able to call my sister that night and she convinced me to call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is 1-800-273-TALK. I knew that I had to do something different. White people don't have the experience of driving down the street and when a police car gets behind them, you know, they thinking, yo, maybe I need to pull over because I don't even want to have any interaction with the police whatsoever because I don't know how this can end. Like that's just, you know, being black and paranoid in America, it's like you, you always gotta constantly guess if something is a matter of color or if it's a matter of circumstance. Like that's what you're constantly questioning. Like, did, did this happen because, you know, just because? Or did this happen because I'm black? When I think about historical trauma, I think about the institution of slavery. You cannot remove the historical trauma, especially the institution of slavery and those institutions that came afterwards. Mass incarceration is traumatizing. And then you have environments that are black people are disproportionately to be in violent environments. So that's exposure to violence. That's a huge risk factor that will accelerate or exacerbate mental health disorders. You think that these kids in Chicago don't have PTSD? They waking up to gunshots all the time. They, you know, every day of their lives, they're probably hearing about somebody they love or somebody they know getting killed, you know, getting murdered. Like, do you think that if you're in a city where it's 70 shootings in a weekend, you're not gonna have some type of PTSD? You think you're gonna get guns pulled on you and have somebody cock a gun and hold it on you? You think you're not gonna have some type of PTSD? Like, that just comes with the territory. Like, any traumatic, experience can can give you PTSD. Folks who are exposed to violence develop anxieties and depression, suicidal ideation, and some uh, epigenetic research shows us that these types of experiences can trigger your predispositions. So uh, if you do have certain predispositions, the environment and having to experience certain things could trigger the way you experience uh, those predispositions. 
find you a spiritual advisor, find you a guidance counselor, find you a therapist, find you an elder, just somebody that you can sit with and just, just get those things off your chest. We've been sold this definition of real in our community that's, that's so false. Like, you know, a lot of times people liken being real with being criminal, you know, doing something that can land you in, in jail or get you killed, you know, dealing with what's going on in here to me is the realest that you can be. Black people will experience racism in the form of explicit differences in services or in quality of care, or they'll experience microaggressions that would discourage them from seeking care. Traditionally, because of our environments, because of poverty, because of black men getting shot by the police, um, because of just a lot, I think that happens for underserved communities, sometimes those other populations cannot respond to and recognize the problems that we're going through. The way forward, what I think, is healthcare professionals, counselors, et cetera, that reflect the communities they're intended to serve. I mean, demographically, socioeconomically, are similar to the communities they're intended to serve.